Hello viewers, welcome to our part 4 series of our research methodology lesson BMCU001. My name is Dr. Yatich Henry and I will be taking you through uh, this presentation today. Uh, in our previous lesson part 3 of research methodology, we did delve and made a lot of discussion with regard to research design. And just to recap that lesson is that we did mention that once you've had or once you've identified your research design, then it becomes important for you to ensure now that with the research design that is appropriate for your study, you are able now to identify and uh, utilize the appropriate research methods that correlate or that augur well with that research design. So allow me again to still insist that in every research endeavor, the research problem is very important. You must have a research problem and once you have the research problem, it is always important that you do a literature review or do a background check of your research problem so that you can understand better the manifestation and the extent of manifestation of that problem and further to that so that you can also enable yourself to ensure that the research problem that you have identified is truly uh, a workable problem, it's a problem that affects an entity, it's affecting a person, an organization, and that even your consumer or the reader of your product, uh, once you complete your research endeavor or the research process, will be, will be able to agree with you that it is true that this research problem exists, and therefore they will be interested to examine what you found out from the research process. So having done that, in our third lesson, we mentioned that once you have that in place and you've done your literature review, you've identified your research cup, and now you've also uh, identified the ethical consideration you're going to consider in that research study, then now you come to the research methodology. And that is where we started in our first lesson by looking at the different terms and the different uh, implications of research methodology. We looked at the three key distinctions of research methodology where we did mention about the qualitative, quantitative and the mixed approach. And then further to that, we also looked at how you can identify a good research title. And the research title will always be informed by your research problem. And just a reminder is that the research problem will always keep on changing. So it is not cast on stone that once you have a research title, that is the working title and the end of your project. It simply means that it's a working title, and until that time that you're through with your project, you've collected data, you've analyzed data, you're now planning to present, then you can actually now have the final research title. Because along the way, and considering that this is an academic writing, chances are, as you continue disseminating your paper, other ideas will come into play, either from your supervisors or maybe from panelists when you're disseminating your paper, or even from colleagues or experts who will tell you that I think this variable may not work well for you, but you can change it to this variable, you can change this variable and focus on this variable and so forth. And therefore, the research title is not cast on stone, but the research problem is very fundamental. Once you've done that, then now in our part three series of our research lec uh, methodology lecture, we did discuss a lot more with regard to the research design. And I gave you 10 or 11 questions that you need to answer so that you can arrive at a very workable research, title, uh, research design or a research design that is appropriate for your study. I also went further and discussed with you the different types of research design, especially the common types of research design, where uh, we did discuss uh, about the descriptive research design, we did discuss about the correlational research design, we did discuss about the experimental research design, clinical research design, and I gave you something to go and read further on maybe the explanatory research design uh, and, and so forth. And so today, as I promised in our previous class, is that we are going to look at the different types of probability sampling methods. And we cannot discuss sampling methods without also understanding the population of your study. So it is important that today in our discussion we are going to understand what is a population, what is a sample, 
and what are the different types of sampling methods that you can engage or utilize in your research project. However, before we move to that discussion, allow me to say that the research design is the one that informs the methods that you're going to use. So every research design that you choose, once you've answered the 10 or 11 questions I gave you in our previous lesson, part three, then you'll, it makes your work easier now to understand what type of probability methods you're going to use, which is a method, what type of analysis. We will come to that maybe in our subsequent lectures and so forth. And it will make your research journey and if, uh, uh, smooth and efficient. So let's look at this po population sampling and sensors. So these are the key concepts that we're going to discuss in our today's lesson. What is a population? What is sensors? What is a sample? And why must you consider sensors? And why must you consider sample? And why must you consider a population? Allow me to say at this point that population from the word population is simply the total number of elements that a particular research study wants to focus on. So it is the total number of entities or the total number of elements in a particular unit, or it, you can put it this way, that it is the entire unit of items, be it people, be it objects, be it animals, be it organizations, be it, name them, or regions. So once you identify your population, then it becomes now easier to move further and maybe decide whether you're going to carry out a census type of study or you're going to sample that population and so forth. And we're going to see the reasons why you must do a census and the reason why you must do a sample. But this is important that first of all we understand what this population is and what it entails. So take it that in simple terms, this is the entire unit of items and I've given you the different examples, be it people, animals, entities, organizations, or objects. So we are told here that population is the universe or the complete enumeration of items in a study. The key word is that we always assume that there is no biasness. Take note that the word assume comes from the word assumption. So we will always assume that that population is the entire population. Why are we considering the word assumption? It is because it is impractical to always get to know all the items in a population. Even when governments carry out annual census or maybe the 10-year census like what they do here in Kenya, I want to believe that is also done for the students who are watching from other countries. And it is always practically impossible for the government to capture everybody in their census. And therefore, that is why now you find that when it comes to the data analysis, they have some tools or, uh, or methods of analysis that they will apply. And most often, when the government does that sense uh, enumeration of people in, in, in a particular state or country, you will find that they always call it a census. And that is our second uh, concept for discussion today. So we will be asking ourselves what, what is census and why census? So at this point we just want to understand that when you are deciding on a population, one, you will be deciding that population with an assumption that you are saying, yes this is my population but because I'm not sure that this population is the entire population then I'll make an assumption that there is no biasness inducing that population. So for example, let's go back to our Japan an India example that we've been discussing along in this series of these discussions. So you want to understand why production in Japan is higher than production in India. And we went further until we identified 15 companies. So the 15 companies that we've identified and the people that you're targeting in that company becomes your population. So before you go there, then the question that you'll be asked is, how did you arrive at the 15 companies? So the, what you have to answer as a researcher is that, what type of industry are you talking about? Because in, that, in our particular lesson, we did agree that you're going to focus on the manufacturing companies. So if 
your focus is on manufacturing companies because we have different types of companies or organizations and U.S. is manufacturing. Then as a researcher, you'll have to answer what type of manufacturing are you considering? Is it the those ones who process, those ones who do value addition, and so forth? So all those companies will fall under the umbrella of manufacturing companies. And I'll give you a good example for, uh, like for example, that what happens here in Kenya. So assume, for example, that Japan is Kenya, and you want to do a study on all the manufacturing companies in Kenya versus the performance of companies in Tanzania. So in Kenya, for example, you'll find that we have an organization, an umbrella organization of all the manufacturers in Kenya, which is the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. So you will have to go to Kenya Association of Manufacturers and ask them to tell you about how many companies are registered with them. So they will tell you we have 5,000 companies registered with us. Then the question is, will you be able to access all those 4,000 or 5,000 companies? then the answer is no, because it is impractical. So you will come and tell us, I think I want to focus on the companies that are in Nairobi. Then we will ask you, how did you choose Nairobi? Then you will tell us, I chose Nairobi because it had the highest number of companies. That is the information that you will get from Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and they will tell you that we have these 5,000 companies, and we have segregated them into these regions, and we have the Nairobi region, and with, in, uh, with your analysis, you are able to realize that Nairobi region has the highest number of companies with, with the diversity in terms of the different types of products they produce and so forth. So you narrow down your population to Nairobi uh, manufacturing companies. And that is why in your title now, like the way we did it for the Japan and the India, you are saying that you are going to study the different types of, or maybe the extent of maybe... Uh, production in Kenya by looking at 15 selected companies in Nairobi. We will go to that when we come to the sampling because now you'll be asked how did you select the 15? So the most important question here is to understand what is the population. So the population is actually all the manufacturing companies in Kenya which is the universe and then we also talk about what is the accessible population. So we have the target population or the population in its entirety. Then we have now the target population. So the target population is the one that you want to infer your findings uh, once you are through with your study. So it is all the entire uh, manufacturing companies in Kenya, which is your target population. But then what is the accessible population? Which one among these companies can you access? And you must provide parameters that you used to select uh, that particular type of company. So if you say you're going to uh, select 15 companies in Nairobi region, then you must provide a rationale that explains how you have arrived at that 15 companies in Nairobi. And that will be handled when we discuss more about uh, the sampling methods. So we have the target population, which is the entire unit. Then we have, of course, the accessible population, which is the population that you can actually access, that you can be able to draw your sample from, and therefore that will be the, maybe the 300 or the 200 companies that are available or that maybe are operational in Nairobi. Now let's go to the second one. Now there is this thing always or this concept normally called census. And I started by saying that when, an, when a country wants to enumerate its all citizens, then they talk of census. Um, or they use the word census to carry out that exercise. Now, as they do that, then we ask ourselves now, what is a census? And the end census is simply um, when all items in the population is considered. So sometimes there are those of you who may want to go out there and carry out a study on a particular organization only. Maybe you are focusing on equity, like uh, if I use the same example that we use in our lesson number four. And you're saying you want to understand more about how equity is able to perform when they serve the low income earners. So if you want to focus on equity bank, then we are saying that you are doing a census of equity bank because depending on the size of the population, then we normally say there is a scenario or there is always a situation whereby you do not need to sample because the population is too small to be sampled. 
So assuming, and I'm using the word here an assumption, that maybe you're focusing on, let's say, Mount Kenya University alone, and you are focusing on maybe, for example, the heads of department or the deans of the schools. And we know that that number may not go beyond maybe, for example, 20. So in doing that, then there is no need for you to sample that small number of people, but you'll have to enumerate or enlist all the 20 deans or the heads of department for your study because that number of people or respondents are very few to be sampled. And therefore, we call that now a census. So, and when it is a census, then it simply goes without saying that the research design that you're going to use is a case study research design, hoping that you still remember the different types of research designs. Then sometimes when this census or when this population of viewers is too large that you cannot cover within the time period that you have as a student or may be given by the company or the organization that has instructed you to carry out a particular research on their behalf, then we say that you have to sample. So the key word here is that if the population is too small, and for this case, for example, I would say, uh, if, you go, if, you read the, if you go and read more on, uh, in statistics books, you'll find that there are books which will say you, tell you that if the population is, uh, let's say, for example, uh, less than 100, then there is no need for you to sample. If it is 30, for example, if, you're only targeting, if your target population is 30 people, let's say you are looking at your target population is the vice chancellors of all the universities in Kenya. And we know that the universities in Kenya are not more than 100. And your target population is the vice chancellors. So the vice chancellors will constitute a population that is not more than 100. So in doing that, there is no need for you to sample that. So you may have to actually carry out a census uh, type of uh, study so that you can reach out to each and every one of them because that population is very small. And therefore, the, because now it becomes a case study, uh, it's not a case study as such, but because you are carrying out the census, then it simply means that you may also have to consider the type of tools and instruments you are going to use to reach out to them. Because one, all these universities in Kenya may be too wide in terms of geographical location, and therefore it becomes impossible or it will be impossible for you to travel to all the different regions of this country where the universities are located and get to interview or maybe, for example, speak to all the vice chancellors. So what you'll have to do now is that once you've considered that, uh, that you're going to do a census, then it is important now that also you decide on the type of tools you're going to use. In this case now, you may want to use a survey because the different people you are targeting are in different geographical locations and it becomes impossible for you to go and, and meet them. So if that is not possible, uh, then now you may also want maybe to do, for example, a telephone interview and maybe call each and every one of them and then uh, arrange for an interview. So that is what census is uh, as far as our discussion is concerned today. So when the population is too, too small to be sampled, then you can do a census and most often is when you're focusing on a small group or a small uh, uh, s a strata of uh, population that you want to target or maybe small n number of farms that you want to target and possibly maybe they might be located in the same region and so forth. But what determines the, uh, the decision for you to go and carry out a census inquiry is if the population is too small to be sampled. However, you can always also do a census inquiry if you have the resources and time. The reason why governments conduct a census inquiry or do a census enumeration of its own people, of all its, 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 people, or its people or citizens, is because they have the resources, they have the time, they have the manpower. And they normally spend uh, billions and billions of shillings or millions and millions of dollars to accomplish that. But for your case as a student, that may not be feasible because you may not have the muscle to amass all those types of resources and therefore you may want to consider yourself doing a sample. 
Now, let's look at the next discussion now. What is sampling? So, I started by saying that when the population is too large, especially for you as a student who is embarking on an academic journey, when that population is too much or is too large to be accessed, then you have to sample. And then we now talk about sampling. So sampling now as an action verb becomes a process. So sampling here becomes a process of obtaining a sample. And in statistics, we normally denote the sample with small n and the population with capital N. So you'll find that you'll use, when you'll be doing your analysis, you might be using these uh, denot, uh, denot, uh, uh, denotations to describe, for example, the sample, uh, the population, and so forth. The way, for example, that we denote the mean with an X bar. And maybe, for example, we denote, for example, standard deviation with S, and maybe variance with lambda. So in this case, we are saying that sampling becomes a process in which now you obtain a sample from a given population, and therefore it becomes a technique. And that is why we said that when you have a research design, then the research design will tell you what type of technique you are going to use. Are you going to use uh, uh, probability sampling methods or non-probability sampling methods? The other important thing that you need to note when you are sampling is that every researcher, you have to plan how your sample will be selected what and what size of a sample would that be. For those of you who have accessed, for example, the research books of uh, Professor Olive Mugenda, uh, that is Mugenda and Mugenda, then they have written quite a number of books on research processes and research methodology and research methods. And some of those books will tell you, for example, if this particular type uh, target population is above this number, then you can take between 10 to 30 percent of that population. If you go now to statistical formula, uh, where in this case, for example, there's always a formula that you can use to calculate a particular population uh, sample, then you, by subjecting your population into that sample uh, formula, uh, like for example, Gracia and Morgan formula, then it will give you a particular population that you will now go and select. Uh, the sample that you're going to collect. So by subjecting your population to that Gracia and Morgan formula, then you can be able to calculate a manageable size of a sample that you can always uh, go to the field and you can access. So what does that mean? It means that the sample design must be determined before the data are collected. And how do you determine that? Please remember our uh, lesson presentation series number three, where we say that the sample, the research methods are informed by the research design. So if you are using, for example, descriptive uh, research design, then you must have considered that what type of data am I going to collect. So if you are going to collect, for example, qualitative data, then you might want, for example, to say the sample design that I'm going to use to select a sample for my study is, let's say, for example, probability sampling method. And probability sampling method agrees with the research design, which is descriptive for that matter. So once you've done that, then we also say that it is important that you select a sample design which is reliable and appropriate for the research studies at hand. So in, to simplify all this, then I want to remind you that the research design is actually the key component that underscores all these requirements that you must consider before embarking on a data collection uh, process. So it is important that once you've identified the research design, it will inform you about all this. So it makes your work easier. So kindly note that the research design will help you to know, or maybe before and even the sample design you're going to use, the, the sampling process, and, and so forth. So what is important, again, to note from here is that the sample uh, sampling is normally done when you cannot be able to access uh, the population uh, at hand. And it is also important to select that sample in such a manner that it is representative of the population. And that is why we are going to look at the different types of sampling methods which will guide us in understanding the appropriate uh, 
the sampling method for the study that you're going to take. Now, having said that, then let's look at the different types of sample designs. Now, before we look at that, uh, I want to present to you, for example, some of the considerations that you must consider before you embark on a sampling process. When you have identified your population, and your population in this case, for example, is all the manufacturing uh, companies in Kenya, which means that if you are choosing a manufacturing company, then you are only choosing a representative from that company to represent the company. Remember, the target population can either be an entity, it could be a person, it could be an organization. So in this case, we are taking the organization as our target population. And of course, the organization will not give you information, but somebody within the organization will give you the information. So we can as well say that the target population or the number of companies is equivalent to the number of people that you're going to target. Depending on the type of data and information you are seeking for, it will inform you on what type and category of a person or a respondent you will target in that company, be it the CEO, be it the finance manager, be it a human resource manager, be it a marketing manager. So it depends on your line of specialization. So for those of you who are doing, for example, marketing, then if you want to understand more about marketing, uh, about the performance of uh, marketing processes in the manufacturing sector in Kenya, then you will sample the companies, but in every company you will pick one marketing officer. Or maybe you will pick the person who is in charge of marketing. Similarly, if you are doing a research on maybe, for example, finance, then you will pick, for example, the finance manager of that company. If it is something to do with management, then you might, you might be forced now to pick the CEO of that company at the corporate level. So the type of universe here we are saying is that it will inform the type of sampling design you are going to use because one, every population, remember now that I will be using synonymously some of these words, the universe, the population, uh, and so forth. So if the universe, for example, or the population is finite, and when we talk about a finite population, then we are saying that a finite population is a population that has an N. Meaning, if you come to Mount Kenya University, you can easily determine that we have 20 deans of schools or we have 60 heads of departments. That is a finite or finite population. An infinite population means that it is a population that you cannot determine how many of these uh, entities or people or objects are they. So it simply means that if it is infinite, then it means you can go on and on and on and you cannot be able to actually understand the entire population. So in finite population, we say that the numbers are certain, but in an, in an infinite uh, universe, then the number of items you are going to target is not known. And if it is not known, then it means now that you may want to sample. If it is known, which is finite, then it means depending on the size, you can as well do a census study. Then we have another concept here that you need to understand and maybe, for example, uh, get to know what it means. Then we have the sampling unit. So the sampling unit is simply the geographical location of a of the respondents you are targeting, or maybe the entity you are targeting, maybe for example a country, maybe a county, or maybe for example uh, a region. So a sampling unit becomes, for example, the geographical location you want to target for your study, and we've, I've given you an example of that. Maybe it's a country, or maybe for example a district, a village, and so forth, or maybe an institution of higher learning. So, if you are doing your study, for example, in Mount Kenya University, then Mount Kenya University becomes the sampling unit. If you are doing, for example, a study uh, in, uh, on all the manufacturing companies in Kenya, and the accessible population is the companies in Nairobi, the ones that you can access, then the 300 or 400 companies in Nairobi becomes your sampling unit because you'll be sampling from the companies in Nairobi and you will not be sampling from the companies in Mombasa.
And again, as I said, you will always be forced or you will be required to explain why you chose Nairobi and not Mombasa and not, for example, Gigali or maybe, for example, if it is Uganda, why you chose Kampala and not Gulu, for example. The other terminology that you also need to take note of is what we call the sampling frame. So we have the population, we have the sampling unit or the sample unit, and then we have the sampling frame. So the sampling frame is simply the list of all the items in that population, which you are going to derive your sample from. So assuming, for example, you want to do a study on manufacturing companies in Kenya, as uh, discussed earlier. And the sampling frame now in this case will be the list of companies that are kept by the Kenyan Association of Manufacturers. So today, if you walk to the Kenyan Association of Manufacturers, they always have a booklet that contains all the companies who are members of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Similarly, if you are doing a study, for example, on employers, then if you go to the Federation of Kenyan Employers, they will give you a list of employers who have registered with them. Or if you want to know, for example, the number of banks registered in Kenya, then you can go to the Central Bank of Kenya, and it will give you, they will give you a list of all the banks that are registered in Kenya, or maybe in Nairobi, be it you are focusing on the region, uh, the Nairobi region in terms of accessibility, and so forth. So the sampling frame is the list of all items that you want to uh, target. So if, for example, on a, loss, on a lower scale, you are doing your study in Mount Kenya University, then when you go to the Office of the Human Resource, they will be able to give you the list of all the heads of department or the deans of schools, and that becomes your sampling frame. So the sampling frame is the list of items you are going to sample from. But remember, the, sampling f that you're, the sample that you're going to take and the sampling process that you're going to use will be determined by the type of population you're targeting. So if the population is finite, then it is easy to sample. If, it is the, po if the population is, is infinite, then it means that an infinite population means that you have to sample because you are not sure of where you are going to get these people. And if it is finite, then it is still easy. It makes your work even more easier to sample. But remember, when it is infinite, we said earlier on that we always have an assumption or we always create room for an assumption that that population is not biased and therefore it remains as an assumption which cannot be proven. Lastly, before we look at the different types of designs and maybe the characteristics, the characteristics of a good research uh, uh, sampling design is that we have also the, this term, uh, terminology called the size or the sample size. So most often for those of you who are going to do their thesis and maybe their projects, you will always be asked, what is your target population? What is the accessible population? What is your sampling uh, design? Or what is your sampling formula? Or maybe your sampling process? What is your sampling frame? And what is your sample size? And how did you arrive at the sample size? We are going to look at that when we come to the different types of sampling designs. So the size of the sample is simply the number of items that have been taken to represent that population. It simply means that the findings of that sample or the answers and maybe the data you're going to collect from this sample and analyze can be replicated back in the population. And that is why we talk about inference. So the inferences, the inferencing of a size of a sample means that once you have a sample that is representative and we are going to look at how we can make that sample representative, then we can, we can as well say that if in Nairobi we have 300 companies and you've sampled only 15 companies, then what you will find from these 15 companies applies also to the other maybe 395 companies in Nairobi. That if a similar study was to be done today by somebody else, then chances are within a certain level of confidence they will find the same answers or the same findings applying or maybe applicable to the, same, the other companies or similar to the findings that you found earlier. So 
That is why we insist that, one, the size of your sample should not be too large also or too small. Because if it is too small, then it is not representative. If it is large, then it will affect you in terms of cost and time. Secondly, we are saying that you, this sampling process must be done with precision. And the precision here, especially when you are dealing with an infinite type of population, is to uh, identify something we call a uh, level of confidence. So you will find that if you are using, for example, the Gratia and Morgan formula to calculate the sample size, you will find that you will always be requested to choose a confidence level. And the confidence level could be 10%, it could be 5%, it could be 20%, and so forth. What that simply means is that if you choose, for example, a 5% confidence level, it simply means that you are 95% sure or you are 95% confident that the sample you've done is representative. And that if there will be any error, then that error will fall under the category of 5%, which is acceptable. So it simply says that you are accepting an error margin of plus or minus 5% and you are telling the consumer or the reader that I am sure if, for example, if I'm sure that this sample I've taken represents the population, that if I find anything about these companies I've chosen in Nairobi and you go back and do another study with the other 300 companies, you'll find the same findings. And if there will be any deviation, then that deviation will be 5%. It will fall under 5%. So it, say, it simply means that you are accepting an error margin of 5%, whereas you are actually saying you are 95% sure. Now, let's look at the characteristics of a good sample design. Number one is that it must be truly representative. So that's the key word. It must be representative. And once we go to the different types of sampling methods, we will understand how representative it can be. Uh, number two is that it must result in what we call a small sampling error. And I've already described in the previous slide that you had used 5% uh, confidence level, 95% uh, confidence level, or 90% confidence level, or 80% confidence level, or 50% confidence level, uh, level. And what you are simply telling the reader or consumer is that you are accepting an error of 5%. That if you go and do this study somewhere else, with this type of sample, then the error of margin or the error that you are likely to get falls within 0 to 5 percent, but you are 95 percent sure. So that it simply means that the results will result or the results of that research will actually lead to a small sampling error. And we normally uh, propose or many statisticians propose a 5 percent sampling error. Number three is that it should be, uh, it should be viable in the context of funds, that is that the viability of that study or of that sample you are taking should also consider the amount of funds that you have for the research study. And that is why I said, for example, sometimes it is very difficult to conduct a census type of study because of the cost involved in it and the time factor and the resources. So the sample size that you choose should consider the element of finances because you cannot do a three-month study and you're targeting, for example, like 600 people because chances are you might not finish or even get those people. And if you might do, then you need quite a large amount of resources to accomplish that. Number four is that it must be done in such a way that systematic bias can be controlled in a better way. There is no better way of controlling bias other than identifying a significance level or maybe identifying a confidence level and uh, we have agreed or we have discussed that you can use a certain level of confidence like 95 percent, uh, 80 percent, but most oftenly we prefer or most statisticians prefer a 95 percent uh, confidence level. You can even use 99 percent, but when you use 99 percent then it means that the sample size will have to go up. Then lastly is that the sample should be such that the results of the sample can be applied in general for the universe. That is what I call the inference. So if you are doing a study in Nairobi of 300 companies or 400 companies and you have only sampled 20 companies, then you are telling us that the 20 companies, when whatever I find from the 20 companies will be applicable to the other uh, 300 or 200 companies that you have not sampled. 
And that is why it is very important that you must spend a lot of time on maybe a lot of consideration in choosing a good sample design and a good sample design that is representative so that you can infer the findings back to the population. Now let's look at the different types of sampling methods. And we have two different distinctions or two different categories of sampling designs. We have what we call the probability sampling designs and the non-probability sampling designs. I'm going to look at first of all the probability sampling designs. And since this is a tutorial presentation, then I expect you to read more on them. So number one, we have what we call the simple random sampling design. Now the simple random sampling design just is explained by the word itself. It is simple random. So it's a randomization of items. So let's say, for example, you have 300 companies in Nairobi that forms the population. So the population is 300 companies and 300 people for that matter because you're going to pick maybe one person in that company. Now, if that is the case, then we are saying, how are you going to select a sample that is representative? Then Olive Mugenda, who is an author of research methods, tells you you can pick between 10 and 30 percent. As long as the population is more than 30, you can pick that. Or as long as it is more than a particular number, you can pick that. So if you're choosing 10 to 20 percent, then you just need to say, uh, what is the 15 percent or what is the 20 percent of 200 companies in Nairobi? Then you find that maybe your, number, your, an, your answer is 60. So you say, I'm going to pick 60 companies. So how are you going to pick the 60 companies? So if you are using the simple random sampling, then you are saying that you have all the 200 uh, companies put together. Uh, let's say, for example, you can list them in a particular order. Maybe you can give them a number and say this company is number one, two, three, up to 200. And then you can uh, maybe, for example, put them into a box or you can roll them over and put them in a box and then check them well and then you pick the first 60. So as you pick the first 60 uh, with your eyes closed, that is a, a basic example of how you can do simple random sampling, then the first 60 that you pick becomes your sample. But because we do not want to do that, because we are working in the age of uh, technological advancement and software advancement, then in Excel, for those of you who are going to use a simple random sampling, we have a simple random generator in Excel. If you are using, for example, statistical package for social sciences, it also has a way, a generator that can help you generate a random sample. So you do not need to now start writing papers and putting them in a box or folding them and then mixing them. Because I've, most of the time you find students saying that is what I did. But how is that possible if you are dealing with a very large uh, size of population? So it is important that you copy all the list of the companies in Nairobi, maybe they are 400. So you copy all their names, put them in an Excel sheet, and then use the formulas in Excel to generate the sample, and you'll have a representative sample. Number two is that we have another type of sampling method, which is a probability sampling method. And allow me just go back a little bit. The difference between probability and non-probability sampling methods, which we'll be discussing next, is that Probability from the word probability gives equal chance to every element in the population. Whereas non-probability is subjective and always has biases in terms of the elements that are supposed to be picked. And we're going to discuss that. So it is important that probability sampling method affords or uh, enables every item to be picked. So if you are not picked, you will not complain because it is what we call random. So it's a probability sampling method. And if you can still recall in statistics the probability sampling tree, where you can start from smaller and then you diverge and the base continues to widen. Then we have the cluster sampling, which is where you divide the population into clusters. And I want you to take note for this uh, in this very clearly. One is that cluster sampling means that you divide your population into clusters or geographical locations. So the key word here is the geographical location because many people always confuse cluster sampling and stratified sampling. And when you come to present your concept paper, you normally confuse the stratas and the clusters. So in a cluster sampling, you always divide the population into geographical locations. So like for example, if you're doing a study 
of the manufacturing companies in Kenya. And the Kenya Association of Manufacturers tells you that we have grouped these companies into different regions. Then you are picking Nairobi region. Then you are picking a cluster sampling. So you have already picked Nairobi as your cluster number one. And that is why I started by saying that you will always be required to justify the method or maybe the technique and the tool you are using. You must always give a reason why you are using it. Is it because somebody else has used it? Is it because it gives you the right um, answers and so forth? But for the sake of this lesson, take note that it is informed by the research design. So the research design will guide you on even the sampling methods that you're going to use. More often, you are invited to read also what other people have done in the same field because you are not reinventing the wheel, so that if somebody used a similar methodology or a similar design to do a sample, then you can still as well use that. So the cluster sampling means you divide the population into clusters, and then now you can use random sampling to select the sample. So you can divide the companies into Nairobi region, uh, central region, uh, maybe Rift Valley region, maybe coastal region, and so forth. And then once you have those clusters in form of geography, then you can say now uh, you're going to pick Nairobi region uh, because it has a high number of companies, and then you pick another geographical region that has maybe less number of companies so that maybe you can contrast the two. And therefore, once you've identified the region, and in this case, let's say you've chosen Nairobi region because it has the largest number of companies, then you randomly select them now. So you say, I've chosen Nairobi, uh, you have different clusters, so you've chosen Nairobi cluster, and the cluster for Nairobi has 400 companies, then you randomly now select the four companies, then you arrive at the 60 companies we've said earlier. Then what about the stratified uh, random sampling? Now, the stratified sampling method means that you divide the population into stratas or groups, but this time around you're not using geographical separation, but you are using other methods. A very good example I can give you is gender. So you can use gender, male or female. So if you are dividing your population into gender uh, differentiation, then you are giving us two different types of stratas. Another further example would be to divide your population into the young and the old. So the characteristics that you are using here is any characteristics and other than geographical. If it is economical separation or division, then you might be looking at low income earners versus high income earners. So that is a strata. And that is stratified uh, random sampling. You might ask me now, once I've divided them into strata, what next? Then the answer is here. Then you can use other methods to now continuously select your sample. And in this case, you can use the simple random sampling or you can use systematic random sampling. Now, what, what is then the systematic random sampling? Systematic random sampling means that you divide your, you have the list of your population, that is the sampling frame, which contains all the list of companies in Nairobi. And then once you've, assuming for example, we are using stratified, let me use stratified. And you are dividing those companies into producing companies, maybe processing companies and uh, let's say, for example, value addition companies. Or maybe you've divided these companies into those who produce and those who process. Or maybe those who produce and maybe those who package. So there are those different types of characteristics you can use. So once you've divided your 400 companies in Nairobi into different stratas, for example, then you can use what we call systematic sampling to collect, to sample your data, uh, to sample your population. And in this case, you are saying that every nth element will be selected. So you will list the number of companies in Nairobi. Let's say, for example, assume you are not using any of these first. You are just using systematic sampling. So you have 400 companies. And Mogenda tells you you take 30% of that. So you've taken 30% of 400, and maybe the answer is 80. So you will give them names. So you will say that you will list them in terms of uh, you can give them num a particular number or maybe a particular alphabet number and say 1 to 400. Then you say 400 divided by 80. Then you say you will get 50. So you will say, uh, sorry, you will get 5. 
So you will say every fifth element is what I'm going to take. So you will count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you pick number 5. Then 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you pick number 11 or you pick number 10. So you will pick, you will pick the fifth element, the tenth element, the fifteenth element, the twentieth element, the twenty-fifth element, like that. That is what we call a systematic uh, random sampling. Then lastly, on the, non on the probability sampling methods, we have the multi-stage sampling method. And in this case, it is as simple as combining more than one method that is provided for here. So if you have a large population that is infinite, and you've divided that population into clusters, let's say you now you've divided them into different geographical regions, Nairobi, Nyanza, Western, maybe Southern, and so forth, and you've decided you're going to take only Nairobi region and maybe uh, Mombasa region because of the number of companies located in that area, then you can still do the stratified sampling. Uh, stratified sampling method. You can still apply this and say, I want to divide the Nairobi uh, population uh, sample again into stratas. And in this case, maybe for example, you are looking at uh, the processing companies and the value addition companies. And then once you've done that now, you can now say, I want 80 companies in these two regions. And I want now to take, let's say, uh, you want to take 80 of them because the sample uh, the, sample, the sample that you've calculated from Mugenda and Mugenda's formula is giving you 80 out of 400. Then you will say, for Mombasa, I will give them, for example, I will pick 30 companies from Mombasa, but in Nairobi, I will pick, for example, 50, which will give you 80. Let's now come to Nairobi, because you will do the same in Mombasa. So in Nairobi, you divide them into these two stratas, the processing companies and maybe the value addition companies. Then you say, Depending on maybe extrapolation, that is for those of you in statistics, you can either uh, use proportionate uh, calculation, you can proportionately calculate that, and then you say the manufacturing companies in Nairobi, I'm going to pick 30. The value addition companies, I'm going to pick 20. Then you say how many companies are in the processing category? Then you say they are 120. Then how many companies are in the, manufacture, in the value addition company? Then you say they are 60. So because you are picking 30 and 20 uh, for the different stratas, then you will now say, I want to use systematic sampling to collect the data. So you will say, every fifth element up to 120, I'll pick. Then you will get your, your number. Every fifth element up to 60 for the value addition companies, I will pick this number of elements. Maybe I pick the third, the fourth, or the fifth. Then we will call that a multi-stage uh, sampling design. Or you can as well use simple random sampling once you are done uh, with the stratas. Lastly, let's look at the non-probability sampling methods. So in the non-probability sampling methods, we did say that the non-probability sampling method is subjective, is biased, and therefore it is always used, but very rarely, and especially if you do not want to infer your findings to the population. So for those people who will do, for example, a case study, then you can use non-probability sampling methods because chances are you are picking everybody in that population. So what are the different examples of non-probability sampling methods? We have convenient sampling, which has another word of haphazard or accidental sampling. We have snowball sampling. We have purposive or judgmental sampling. And we have the quarter sampling. For convenient sampling, I would say that this is where you select your respondents depending on where you meet them. Let's say you want to go and collect data in a supermarket. So you just go and stand at the door of the supermarket and everybody who enters, you pick them until you get your number that you want. Why is it subjective? It is subjective because you cannot tell who went out and came back. So you can be able to pick more than the same person. Uh, you can pick one person maybe twice or thrice. And that is why we say it is haphazard or accidental or convenience. Then we have the snowball sampling. The snowball sampling is normally utilized when the population or the respondents you are looking for cannot be found, or maybe they are hidden, they cannot be known, and therefore you have to use referrals. Let's say, for example, you are doing a study on transgender people or the LGBT people. Getting those people is very difficult. So if you know one of them, then you can actually use that person, let's say Jane, to help you 
refer it to another person and another person. That is what we call snowball sampling. Chances, why is it subjective? It is subjective because Jane can decide to pick on his friends alone and maybe leave out the other people who might have given you or me will have given you the, uh, maybe better answers. Then we have purposive sampling. This is normally done with the knowledge of the researcher. So maybe, for example, I know Jane as the VC of Mount Kenya University, and I know Mike as the VC of Joma Kenyatta University. Then I will use purposive sampling because I purpose to go and target them. Then lastly, we have the quota sampling where you can divide your population into groups. Let's say you have 400 companies in Nairobi, then you simply divide them into quarters. There is no criteria here. You are just dividing them into four, so you have 100, 100, 100. Then you just decide, I want to pick 100 of these companies. It is subjective because you are not giving every item the chance to be selected. So having said that, uh, I think we have come to the end of our presentation today. Thank you very much for listening, and let's meet next time on our Part 5 series of Research Methodology. Thank you very much.